들어. 네. Good morning, everybody. So, how, how many how many of you were in uh, David's session uh, yesterday? Oh wow! All right, should we try it one more time? <laughs> Good morning, everybody. <laughs> uh, I want to welcome you on behalf of the Deming Institute and Iowa State University. It's been a terrific partnership and we're looking forward to a weekend of fun and having a lot of learning too. My name is Kevin Cahill. I'm Dr. Deming's grandson and also the executive director of the Deming Institute. I grew up with my grandfather and knew him very well growing up and had the opportunity to have him alive and present during the early stages of my business career. I knew him well enough to know that he would have appreciated and loved this conference in the theme, quality as a strategy for success in business and education. He believed that he could inspire each and every person who attended his seminars, workshops, and conferences to make a positive difference. He believed he could get them to think differently, ask better questions, and seek new knowledge. And that these people, their organizations, and everyone around them would be successful if they did those three things. My grandfather lived through some of the most profound changes in history. Changes that shaped his view of the world and his philosophy. He was born in 1900, saw the devastation created by World War I, and lived through the agony of the Depression in the 30s. When World War II broke out, he was one of the experts brought in to help aid the U.S. war effort at a time when it was critical to create new weapons and produce ones that worked better than those of the enemy. He had a tremendous impact on the engineers. How many engineers are in here? A lot of them. Tremendous impact on the engineers he worked with and believed the U.S. was poised to create a world of high quality goods after World War II. But the engineers who learned so well during the war were not always in charge afterwards. Top management instead focused on quantity, not quality. We were the only country, country in the world that could produce the needed goods. We had a captive audience. It did not matter how good or lousy the product, everything we made sold. My grandfather's ideas were forgotten in the United States. But in the 1950s, he was invited as, as a guest to a series of lectures and gave a series of lectures to the Japanese engineers. He was invited by Konichi Koenaga of the Japanese Union of Science and Engineers. Japan, of course, had been devastated in the aftermath of World War II, and they were looking to rebuild. And they looked towards the people who had helped the U.S. war effort become so successful. And he was one of them. So they asked him to help. He had learned his lesson from World War II. He had seen and experienced what happened when top management did not understand. So he insisted that top management, not just the engineers, they had to be there too, but that top management also be in attendance. And over a number of years, between 1950 and 1960, over 80% of the capital structure of Japan. 80% of the capital structure of Japan attended his seminars. In the next 20 years, as we all know, Japan went from rubble to becoming one of the most powerful economic engines in the world. In 1960, Emperor Hirohito awarded my grandfather the second order med medal of the sacred treasure and gave him a considerable amount of the credit for the Japanese economic miracle. 
But it wasn't until 1980 when a program aired in prime time on NBC, If Japan Can, Why Can't We?, that my grandfather's ideas were rediscovered in the United States. By that time, the world economy was very different than it had been in the immediate post-war era. And the fast-growing service industry was also now a major component. So at the age of 80, in 1980, he began a second career in the United States, one in which he worked virtually seven days a week, not only to help save traditional companies such as General Motors, Ford, and Xerox, but to help hospitals, education, and the service industry. In those last 13 years of his life, his philosophy continued to evolve from his famous 14 points to the development of the system of profound knowledge, a more universal management approach that extended far beyond even the typical industrial companies. He's now considered one of the most influential people of the 20th century, and his ideas are used in all types of organizations. Deming was committed to helping people understand we all needed to work together as a system with the aim for everybody to win. To do that, we needed cooperation and transformation to a new style of management. We needed to think differently, ask better questions, and seek new knowledge. When we do, good things happen. We often try without consideration of the others. They all work together too, just like the system of profound knowledge, and are interrelated. And this weekend will help you see that. My grandfather and the Institute believe that these elements will open your eyes to a new way of thinking you may not have been exposed to yet. I challenge you over the next two days to live the Deming philosophy and view your organization and the world and your lives through a different lens. I promise you, you'll learn something new and exciting. The last challenge I make is that if you took a look at the schedule and said, I'm going to attend all business tracks, or you looked at it and said, I'm going to attend all education tracks, Try something different. Think a little bit different. Take a chance and go, if you're planning on doing just all business, go to one of the education tracks. You're going to be exposed to something that you might never have thought about, and I promise you it will be pertinent to what you're doing. And the same thing. If you're going to all education tracks, try one of the business tracks. You'll get something different that you didn't even expect. I also want to thank two people, Dick Steele, if you could raise your hand, and Jack Hillerick, Jack. Jack's in the back right there. Um, for the students, I wanted to let you know, Jack and Dick are the ones who are providing the student scholarships. And uh, if you have a chance, get a, uh, come up and say hello to them and thank them for that opportunity. It's a terrific, it's one of, the, one of the big things for the Institute is to have students come in and have an opportunity to see what the Institute believes, what the ideas are about, and hopefully it'll set you down that new road towards transformation, towards looking at things differently than you, than you ever did. This, I believe strongly this conference will serve you well. I also want to acknowledge a couple of other people, Dr. Deming's daughters, my mother, Diana Deming Cahill, and my aunt, Linda Deming Radcliffe, in the back. Linda, can you raise your hand? And also, both of them on the Board of Trustees of the Deming Institute, and I also want to acknowledge my brother, who is right there. So thank you all very much, and I am now going to introduce the next speaker. Thank you, I appreciate the time. Dave Sly. How many of you know Dave? I think that'll be a few hands here. Here we go. Now, Dave, I got a couple of good stories last night as I was talking to him. But I'll leave those for uh, lunchtime. <laughs> good, huh? He knows that. Dr. Dave Sly is a senior lecturer within the IMSC Department of Iowa State University and also president of ProPlanner, a web-based industrial engineering software firm 
located at the ISU Research Park. Dave teaches technical sales, engineering economics, industrial automation, and lean manufacturing. Dave is the ISU IMSC coordinator for this conference. I also want to personally thank Dave for his energy, enthusiasm, and time that he's put into this. Dave, it's been terrific working with you over these past few months, and it's greatly appreciated what you've uh, been able to do in terms of introducing the students to this opportunity. Thank you very much. on the bottom. And I also want to encourage you to talk to some of the industry people here and how they apply Deming's practices and what they know, you know, on the real world. One of the things we always are challenged with here at the university environment is bringing, you know, real world ideas, real world concepts, real world people into the classroom to give you a much broader learning experience. So, as I mentioned, not just uh, the speakers who will be an awesome resource for you, but the others here in the audience. Uh, please intermingle, please uh, get to know them. The other thing I wanted to say is I want to really thank you for attending. Uh, Iowa State University has uh, had a great turnout for this, our students. We have 148 students registered for this conference. So congrats to you guys for that. Perhaps one of the best things is I believe that Purdue average is around 70 to 90. So we did one of those that we beat Purdue uh, and Michigan and well, we did a few others. But anyway, congratulations to the students. And then one last thing I wanted to say is uh, if they're, you're a grad student, please raise your hand. Uh, we, have a, look at, we have a lot of graduate students here, and I think this is great. I love it when graduate students get involved with these kinds of activities. Uh, once again, it's just a great opportunity for you to broaden your knowledge and, and really look at these uh, principles as things that you can incorporate in your graduate studies as well. Um, with that said, I want to uh, introduce another speaker, uh, Dr. Janice Turpany. Uh, she's the department chair and inaugural holder of the Joseph Walkup Professorship in Industrial and Manufacturing Systems Engineering here at Iowa State. She's the, uh, uh, the department chair of, of the department I work with, which is responsible for bringing this conference here to Iowa State. Uh, she comes to ISU from Virginia Tech, where she was a professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering and in the Department of Engineering Education, uh, and an affiliate of the Department of Industrial and Systems Engineering over there. Uh, Dr. Tepeni also served as Program Director for the Division of Undergraduate Education at the National Science Foundation, NSF, and was one of the founders and directors of the Center for E-Design, which is a multidisciplinary uh, university NSF cooperative research center. Uh, please help me welcome Dr. Tepeni. Well, welcome. It's um, my privilege and honor to um, have us be hosting the Deming Institute Conference. And, and um, I want to, I know there's been so many thanks already, but um, really thanks to Dick and to Jack. Um, also, I want to say that uh, the College of Engineering at um, Iowa State also helped to provide some of the funds for the student attendees. So we were very lucky to get that funding as well. And um, the uh, magic behind the AV, uh, Paul Jewell and his team, thank you very much. And as well as I guess we've already um, thanked conference services. Uh, I have been at Iowa State a whopping one year now. And in this one year, there's so much that's happened. And one of the great privileges that I had was not very long after my arrival was when uh, Dick came to visit. And that's when we started talking about the Deming Institute and um, bringing me up to speed on his long-term commitment to Iowa State and also to the notion of um, supporting the course development and the knowledge about Deming and teachings and quality as a priority for the institution. So thank you very much, Dick. And my hope is that this is a big step, uh, but one for many years to come of our partnership and continuing to work together. Um, 
Perhaps, I guess it's interesting. So part of the story that I relayed to Dick back then was I can vaguely remember, and of course my memory gets worse the older I get, unfortunately. That's a quality issue we need a solution for. Uh, but I think it might have been somewhere around 1990 or 91 that I had the honor, I think it might have even been in Charlotte, North Carolina, when Dr. Deming gave a talk that uh, I actually attended with many other people from Virginia Tech at that point. Um, I was actually a graduate student at that point in my life, having had a zigzag path uh, returning from working in industry. And uh, clearly there was a large gathering and he was very inspirational. I also, over the years, um, had fun with some of the tools and methods that he actually came up with, including one of them being called the red bead experiment. I don't know how many of you have ever heard of the red bead experiment. Okay, great. And that's always a lot of fun because it's very engaging and it involves um, role playing for students and you really kind of get to embrace uh, some of what his teachings are firsthand. Because to hear is one thing, but to do is completely different, actually. Um, so I've certainly embraced statistical quality control naturally as an industrial engineer over time. And I think the interesting thing for me is that my style of leadership, while maybe not as conscious of some of the teachings of Dr. Deming, have really embraced it. So for example, this um, I'm all about uh, helping individual students, faculty, and staff, and even people that I work with in industry, still a lot. The idea is to be passionate about what it is that you choose to do, and, to be, and that brings about that engagement. And so I believe that my role as a leader and manager, which is not as fun as being a leader, um, in the Department of Industrial Manufacturing Systems Engineering is to learn about what people are passionate about and to do my best to um, help uh, support whatever those passions are. And for us to come together to have a common vision and goals such that we can see how those individuals fit into that. And so that's really, and in this first year, so there's been so many things that have changed in one year. Our research productivity has gone up exponentially. Uh, we hired three new faculty uh, who started this fall. Our student enrollment has gone up tremendously from uh, almost by 100 students in a year for a department that's about a third more than um, previously. And we've had a number of collaborations within um, the department with across departments in the College of Engineering and beyond that have also grown. So it's really an ex it's been a very exciting year. And um, so I'm just very happy to tell you about that. The other thing that I'll relay is I want to learn more. Uh, my ears will be really wide open to hear more about how the Deming philosophies can be applied to uh, education. Uh, as, I, as Dave mentioned, uh, I had a joint appointment in the Department of Engineering Education at Virginia Tech. In fact, I chaired the committee that came up with the PhD in engineering education. And I also served as a program director at the National Science Foundation for the Division of Undergraduate Education. So I hope what that does is it relays to you that I believe uh, education is extremely important. Yes, our research productivity is because really the idea is to transform, you know, make that bridge between our preparation of the next generation who are capable of leading the nation and solving real problems. Uh, there's quite a few people across the country who look at uh, engineering education from a research perspective, not one where we just dabble and try new things, but we actually use methods to assess and evaluate to determine what really does work. And so I'm kind of thinking that there's some of these approaches that categorically probably fit into some of the um, methods that I'm familiar with, but I'd like some wild hair ideas. Those are great. So anyway, thank you for being here. I'm really excited about the next day and a half or so, 
and hope that you'll be engaged and have your minds wide open to what the possibilities are too. Thanks.